Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here, and that's it. That's great. That's fine. And um, this is kind of quite a light-hearted um, presentation, and I'm just going to zoom through some of the uh, projects I've had the privilege to work on. Uh, so I've worked with um, NASA colleagues for, for many, many years, and I just wanted to give a flavor of the, of, the, of the breadth of the things that we've been working on and come back full circle to some of them again. Um, I also wanted to give credit to members of uh, my research group, past and present, many of whom have now defected to the USA. Uh, Peter, my first uh, graduate student, is now working at Goddard, and Steve is a professor at Rice University, and uh, Vanessa here is now part of the IRIS team in, in Lockheed. So um, my, my collaborations with NASA, my encouragement for them to come over here and meet people seems to have borne fruit in the sense that they then have left the UK and, and moved over here. Giulio Delzana here um, now leads the group, and many of you may know his name. He's been with me for many years, and uh, we've had some very fruitful collaborations together. Uh, Dergish uh, worked as a postdoc in my group for many years and now leads the group at Pune in India, um, the solar physics group there, and I'll mention him a, a little bit more later on. Um, Sargam here was my uh, last graduate student, um, and I'm going to talk about her work tomorrow. So I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about some science uh, work um, tomorrow morning. She's worked on active region jets. Um, Jeff here is, is a research student of Steve, so I consider him to be my academic grandchild. And uh, Andrew is now a lecturer at Exeter, and uh, um, Yarrow there, we've done a lot of work on non-Maxwellians with. He's also, a, he had a Royal Society uh, fellowship to work at Cambridge for several years, and we keep a close collaboration. So you will all be familiar with this, and I wanted to share with you uh, my passion for uh, total eclipses of the sun. I've been privileged enough to experience three total eclipses of the sun, and I wanted to, to share that uh, with you. Um, phenomenal, and it's the only time you know, with our own eyes that we can actually uh, look at the sun and see that uh, solar corona. So where did this passion start? Well, this passion started way back um, in my graduate days, uh, too far in the past to, to remember. Um, but at University College London, Professor Mike Seaton was my supervisor um, over there. And he was headed up an atomic physics group at University College London. And different members of his groups were working on different applications to astrophysical problems. The gentleman here with him is Dr. Alan Burgess, who was uh, responsible with Mike Seaton for um, uh, making the formulation for dielectronic recombination and realizing how important it is uh, for the solar corona. Now, uh, Mike Seaton used to be quite a regular visit to Jiller in Boulder, um, and he worked closely with several people, including Dave Hummer here, who was at Jiller. Many of you may, may, have know him, may, may know him or have known him sadly no longer with us, and he ran um, a big project, the Iron Project, carrying on from what we call the Opacity Project, which uh, Mike Seaton led. So we still work with members of the UCL group, in fact, with Pete Storey, who's, still, who's retired, but is, was a professor there. So um, what did Mike Seaton do when I arrived? Well, he presented with me with some eclipse observations from 1952, um, which... Uh, I was still quite young at that time, in 52. Uh, but there were some um, fantastic observations by Ali and Leo. They had um, a curved uh, slit, and they, they saw many of the uh, coronal lines. They had a coronal condensation, so there was basically an active region on the, on the sun. So he presented me with a, with a paper and said, OK, what I want you to do, Helen, is to, to produce the atomic data uh, that can be used to analyze uh, these observations. Now, as many of you will know, um, these forbidden lines are due to uh, transitions within the ground configuration. They, they took a long time to be identified because nobody realized the corona was so hot. Um, but the careful work by Edlin, Grotian, uh, based on laboratory work and extrapolations along isoelectronic sequences enabled them to identify the 
coronal green line as the transition in the ground configuration of uh, iron 14 and the red line in the ground configuration of iron 10. Now, although these transitions are in the ground configuration, it's not sufficient just to treat this as a two-level atom. You actually have to calculate uh, all the atomic data and excitation up to the excited configurations because this level, which um, emits the line, is populated by um, excitation to the higher levels and then cascade down again. So it was my task using the codes that had been developed at University College London to actually calculate accurately uh, the predicted intensities of these lines for different conditions, different densities and temperatures. So that took me three years. However, I was using some rather out of date. Some of you may recognize some of these. I think the younger people here may not recognize some of these. Uh, a slide rule, I don't know how many of you have used a slide rule. The older members here would have, you remember a slide rule? Log tables, if I said somebody, log tables. Okay, um, I used to actually draw graphs at one stage. <laughs> Um, Mike Seaton was very pedant pedantic, very, very good supervisor, very encouraging, the sort of person you, you came out of his office feeling more better than when you went in, which is my, a mark of a good supervisor for me. But I still remember him telling me, uh, Helen, he said, before you draw that graph, do sharpen your pencil. <laughs> so, okay, I've got that one. Um, and punch cards. Okay, we didn't type things into a computer, we punched cards, and we took them down to the computer reception and we gave the pack of cards to the computer reception and then overnight they would run the job. You'd rush back in the morning to find the printout and it had run out of time or it had failed or something. Not only did it print out, but it actually punched the output as punch cards. So I, the output then had to go into other programs. So I used to carry 2,000 cards up and down the stairs to feed it back into other, into other programs. And then time was taken in actually trying to find which punch card had been duplicated because the programs didn't actually work because the data input was wrong. Anyway, so now with our modern technology and our super duper computers and our mobile phones, which are far more powerful, we can do some of these calculations much more quickly. I don't think that's always an advantage, to be honest, because we had a lot of thinking time. So it took a while we had to think between submitting things and then we had a little bit of time to spare. So uh, we maybe there were some advantages in things being a little bit slower. So I worked on the coronal visible lines, and they're still very close to my heart. I'm very fond of the coronal visible lines. I'm very pleased to see that um, they're still of interest. They're still being used. They're still providing some good results. But then uh, when I had finished my graduate work, uh, Mike Seaton encouraged me to spread out and to move into the ultraviolet. Now, the ultraviolet lines, this is a very good rocket spectrum, very old, but extremely good full sun rocket spectrum, uh, 160 to 220 nanometers by Malinowski and Haru. This has a little story as well. I won't deviate too much, but <laughs> Julio, who I work with now, is also very um, pedantic. He's very careful. Any of you who have worked with him, you will know he is very careful, very pedantic. And um, Sometimes when we moved from one building to another, which I'll show you, we, we had to trash things. We had to throw things away. Okay, so I actually threw away something which is quite valuable, which was Monique Malinowska's thesis. And um, Julia rescued this thesis from the trash and actually published a paper using the unpublished works that were in that thesis. So now you'll find Julia going through my trash quite regularly to see what, <laughs> to see what he can pick up. But um, Julio is also very precise in that he does look at the record going back in time. And what I found sometimes is we don't just have a sunspot cycle. We have a cycle of rediscovery. So each new mission that we have, young people will sometimes rediscover things that actually we have known about but maybe not been too published. So I think having a history of what is the work that has been done back in time uh, is very useful. And, and sometimes it's necessary to remind people that basically that work uh, has been done. So I um, 
Mike Seaton, who, since he worked a lot with Agilla, uh, was very keen for me to come to the USA. And after I'd finished my uh, graduate work as a young postdoc, he um, arranged for me to go to Goddard Space Flight Center and to go to the Naval Research Laboratory. And at Goddard, I had a very fruitful and lasting collaboration with a colleague called Anand Bhatia. We did a lot of uh, detailed atomic physics calculations for solar physics. At NRL, I was due to meet somebody. I won't name them who it was. And he sat me in his office and said, I don't know why you're bothering to do that, because I've, I've done that already. So that didn't put me off, because actually we did go on and do it, and we did it actually much better than what he'd done. But the advantage of being at NRL was that I met George Doshik, a completely different character, full of inspiration and full of enthusiasm. And so the journey wasn't entirely wasted. I also visited Boulder at that time and um, ran into somebody who said, well, we have this series of workshops happening here in Boulder. Let me see if we can get you involved in them. Um, and, and I was very grateful for that because actually, not only is Boulder a very beautiful place, um, but these workshops were extremely valuable in establishing relationships and long-lasting uh, collaborations. So there was a series of um, three workshops, and for the younger people here, if they haven't looked at the books, there was a book produced for each of them. I encourage you to do that because there was a lot of detailed results, a lot of detailed studies in each of these. I wasn't uh, part of the Corona Holes workshop, but I did um, become part of the Solar Flares workshops. Now, these workshops were rather unique in a way, because perhaps there was plenty of money available, but the costs were paid. But we had a series of three workshops. So the first workshops, and we were split into teams to address different questions. The first workshop was getting to know each other, getting to see what the questions were to answer. The middle workshop was designed to see how much progress we'd made with those particular uh, questions. And then the third workshop, supposedly, to, to look at the uh, results of what we'd obtained. And in between times, we visited different uh, institutes, for example, Harvard, NRL, to work with people and collaborate with now, certainly, I was very honored because I don't think there were so many people from Europe involved in them. It was mostly people from the States. But I did um, build up um, a network of uh, very strong collaborations with my colleagues um, in the States. These are, of course, just some illustrations uh, from Skylab observations, the Corona Hall observations and the X-rays, and the um, uh, overlapogram, as it's so yeah, fondly called, uh, from NRL. So we had some, as I say, would encourage people to look at those old um, books because they still have valuable information in them. I did come back for the Solar Act. I wasn't part of the Solar Active Regions team, but my husband, who was working with people at NCAR and uh, NOAA, uh, he was visiting, and uh, I came back with him for a couple of months for Tim Boulder, and I said, well, while I'm here, might as well go along to one of the workshops. And um, I'm sure whether that was a mistake or a good thing. I had a three-month-old baby with me, so that was a bit of a surprise for them. Um, but actually, well, I was encouraged to work, uh, write a chapter with Ken Deere. So Ken Deere and I actually wrote, wrote a very useful chapter, I think, for the Solar Active Region uh, book. I also tried to get the baby. I gave a seminar at Goddard with the baby on the bench in the front, which was everybody remembered for quite a long time afterwards. Um, and I also got into NRL. And um, they had to have a special meeting of the captain and the committee to see if they would allow me and my baby to go into NRL to visit George. And they decided they would. But uh, when we went out of NRL, um, George had to sign a form, which amused him greatly to say that the baby had not shown any undue interest in the confidential parts of the laboratory. <laughs> so for, um, with Ken Deere, I did a huge amount. I've worked very closely with Ken over the years, uh, both on the uh, solar analysis side and also with Chianti, which we'll come back to in a minute. We looked at uh, th this overlapogram. was very useful for looking at compact flares, very small features or things on the limb. And we studied some compact flares 
and we used we identified a lot of the lines in the in the spectrum and we were able to get a density as a function of temperature for this one particular flare that we were looking at and we were able to see we were able to get the density from line ratios and get the density from sort of emission measure and we were able to see that we were actually resolving these small loops or at least these small loop structures were were filled up so this is just a sample of that spectrum I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the work because I don't have time. I wanted to share with you some other things. Um, but I also worked a lot with George on the uh, NRLB instrument. And uh, we studied some, some flares, standard model for a flare. And what we say is this is me and George in Cambridge. And actually, we didn't just study flares. In those days, we actually wore them as well. So, did a lot of work, and one of the lines that George introduced me to, um, which is particular special for me, is the iron 21 line at uh, 1,354 angstroms. A very interesting line, uh, because it's in the uh, um, far UV, but, but you can actually spatially, um, sorry, spectrally resolve it. So, the lines in the X-ray wavelength are very interesting, but it's very difficult to to measure those, those widths. But with the iron 21, it, ha it also has a, a carbon-1 blend here, which is much narrower, but that enables you to get a very accurate measurement of any wavelength shifts that you're uh, observing. And I'll come back later on um, and um, tell you about some work that my student Vanessa was doing with Iris, because Iris uh, also observes this iron 21 line. So George introduced me to that line. I did calculations, which enabled us to interpret that line, and we did quite a lot of work uh, with, with that line. So, uh, having been at University College London, uh, my husband, uh, who has worked all his life for the British Antarctic Survey, I think he, he lives in Antarctica and he comes home occasionally. Even now he's retired, he goes down on the Antarctic tour ship, so I do see him from time to time, but I usually have to go down to Antarctica to see him which I'm allowed to do now because he's on the tour ships. His uh, British Antarctic survey moved to Cambridge. And uh, as any of you might know, if, you're, if you've got a partner who's in a particular career or in research, it's kind of difficult to find positions in the same location. Well, I was extremely lucky because um, Alan Burgess, who was working with uh, Mike Seaton, was actually um, a lecturer here at the Department of Applied Mathematics. And so I was able to transfer my postdoc uh, from uh, London to Cambridge. Very, very fortunate. And a very, a very again, a very pedantic, a very, very good atomic physicist, very careful in his work, very theoretically right. He had, a, he had a few faults, did Alan. And one of his faults was once he'd solved a problem, he didn't really see the point in publishing it. So he shoved it in a drawer. And when some student or postdoc came in and said, well, he's doing this, he's see this, and he'd say, oh, yes, just a minute. And he would pull it out of his drawer and, and say, oh, yeah, no, I looked at that about 10 years ago. So um, we did persuade him that it was important to publish, but he didn't, he, once he'd solved the problem, he didn't always see the need to publish it. Very bright guy. Cambridge was a bit of a shock to me. I don't know if people have been there or know it. It was a bit of a shock. It was a different culture from London. And it took me quite a long time to get used to it. And I, I, I went through difficult times sometimes with funding, because it's not so easy in, in, in England to survive on soft money. You needed a position, and getting a position at Cambridge is, is non-trivial. Uh, but this man here, I wanted to give credit to him. He was the head of department, and he was very supportive of me. And he um, knew I was in a difficult situation, because I'd banged on his office door and told him. And he put together a package which actually got me the foot on the ladder. Uh, it was a package to do with faculty work, and it was a package to do with research contract from Rutherford Lab to work on Soho. But it was very important. And I, I remember he, he's no longer with us, but I remember him, and I remember the people that have been important in my lives and that have helped me. And it reminds me that we must also look at the people, the younger people that are coming up, and see in what ways we can support them too. So. Let me move on. Solar maximum mission uh, was the next um, NASA uh, project uh, that I had the privilege to work on. And um, very exciting mission. I'm my, my speciality from the atomic physics background is in spectra. You would have gathered that. 
uh, UV spectroscopy, X-ray spectroscopy. This had an X-ray telescope, XRP, which had a fixed crystal and a bent crystal. So it looked at the X-ray lines in great detail, and I worked with the Rutherford Appleton lab on that. And it also had an instrument, UVSP, which uh, looked in the ultraviolet. And I did quite a lot of uh, work uh, with the team um, led by Bruce Woodgate and with um, other colleagues at Goddard. Just because I'm in Boulder, this is your HAO instrument. I didn't actually work with it for the coronagraph very much, but I worked with the spectrometers. Of course, um, SMM had a problem. It didn't. Uh, it had a fuse blow, or however we describe it in simple terms. It had a. It had a problem. Uh, so it only worked for a period of time. Gave us a little flavour of what we were going to see, and then uh, didn't work, and didn't work for a, for a little while. But it was repaired on the space shuttle. Fantastic, and this shows you the value of actually being able to go up there and to change components and to repair spacecraft, as indeed Hubble Space Telescope was. So this is an example of uh, some of the X-ray lines. We've got a lot of satellite lines here, around about um, 1.9 angstrom, so it can give you diagnostic information about the, about the plasma. I worked a lot with Ken Phillips and did identifications for the X-ray lines um, between 5 and 25 angstroms. Um, but um, this, this, this data has been reproduced in some other instruments, but um, uh, we've we worked with uh, Janusz Sylvester, for example, uh, with the uh, Russian uh, space, spacecraft. But it's a pity that more attention has not been paid to the X-ray wavelength range uh, with the solar observations because they're very rich in diagnostics. So what sorts of things were we interested in doing? Uh, well, this is a whole series of inner shell uh, transitions for the iron ions. And it, it obviously very good for studying uh, solar flares. One thing we were particularly interested in with, the, um, with George is the evaporation uh, of the material after you've had the initial energy release. How does the evaporation uh, come up the, the legs of the loops. Now, they could see blue shifts uh, with the X-ray instrument, but the BCS uh, and the FCS, FCS covered quite a big field of view, about eight, eight art minutes, I think. BCS was full sun. So really, they couldn't locate those with regard to the flare itself. And one of the projects that I worked on with the UV uh, team, this is UVSP, with uh, Joe German and Dick Shine and Richard Harrison, uh, was to try to spatially locate where the Iron 21 was coming from. And uh, we were able to, uh, to do this, it, but we had to um, devise a lot of complicated, so complicated that even Dick Schein, who's a real whiz kid, uh, found it difficult to analyze the data. Uh, but we were able to see it coming from the, from the put, footprint regions, which have now been confirmed with uh, later work, for example, with Iris. So not only was it a fruitful time scientifically, but as you can see, by this time, I got two children. Um, and uh, we, we made regular visits to Goddard Space Flight Center, to, which was the operations for uh, Solar Maximum Mission to work there. My husband was working at the University of Maryland. Uh, so what did we do? We had to, I, for, I was, I'm very fortunate in life because I had four sisters. And my sisters each took it in turn to come out with me when I was coming out we paid their fare and everything to look after the children. So they sat by the pool talking to the lifeguards uh, while, I was, while I was working. It's a problem. If you have a family, you need to keep traveling. You need to go, keep going to conferences. You need to keep working. And that isn't always easy. Nowadays, many conferences, not all, do offer some support for child care or some support in that way. But it can be problematic at, at critical times in your career if you don't have that. Obviously, we paid for everything ourselves. And obviously, I was running at a loss or using my husband's salary to actually keep, keep going. But very important for me to be able to, to do that. I also wanted to mention Hertz, because uh, I don't think that this gets enough attention. Hertz was a, an extremely good instrument uh, led by the Naval Research Laboratory. It's a rocket flight. It was flown several times, but it was also on Space Lab um, and produced some really good um, observations for the transition region lines. And Bruckner, 
who was leading that group and was again working with Ken Deere. Um, a tremendous instrument. And it also had, uh, in a similar way to Iris now has, it had a slit and, a, and an image. So you could place where the spectra came with regard uh, to the uh, features that you were looking at. So a great privilege to be able to work with that team. So now SOHO. SOHO has taken up um, a good part of my, of my life, um, even before launch, obviously, as, as you know preparations for any space mission or any um, in new instrument takes a long time before you actually get it launched and then there's a lot of work afterwards. So I was involved um, with CDS uh, long before the launch with the preparations of a software, in particular diagnostic software. I worked with uh, somebody called Dave Pike who was uh, responsible for the uh, software for uh, CDS coronal diagnostic spectrometer. And I have to say, it was all ready and there and available when SOHO was launched. I can't say the same about all the instruments, uh, but for that particular instrument, it was important to have those things in place. So SOHO had 11 instruments, 12, I thought it was 11, 11 or 12, can't remember now, um, instruments uh, designed to so study the solar interior, uh, the solar atmosphere, and the solar wind. Of course, um, individual instruments are complicated, particularly spectrometers. So they take a lot of um, time, analysis, software, a lot of knowledge to get used to using them. But often, the best science can be derived by combining uh, data from different instruments. And that's obviously what SOHO and SOHO we try to do, but also combining cross different satellites so we need to see these things in context. Uh, so we, with SOHO, we would have you know, weekly um, science planning meetings and then daily uh, science planning meetings to look at precisely what instrument would be looking at at the particular time. Now, um, again, SOHO was operated from Goddard Space Flight Center, so um, that was the place that we were working. And uh, it was very, um, it was a great experience to be there. This image from uh, EUV, uh, EIT, EUV Imaging Telescope. Um, I can still remember when I first saw that image on the plasma screen. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, these little regions were sparkling all over the sun. And just, just to see that uh, image and attempt to try and put it in context and understand some of those features. I mean, we had seen samples, of course, in the past, but to see it like that, I mean, we'd seen samples from Skylab, but Skylab used photograph, pho uh, photo, photographic plates and things, so you didn't have the continuous uh, observations like this. Absolutely amazing. But as I said, my main focus was on the coronal diagnostic spectrometer, and with a spectrometer, you get the spectra at each position along the slit. Um, and you can build up a raster, but it takes time to build up a raster over a region. So it has advantages and disadvantages. You get a huge amount of information, but it also takes time to build up um, that raster. And you have a lot of decisions to make because actually you can't get all the data down that's actually up there. So you've got to decide in advance what your observing sequence is going to be, what your scientific objectives are, and then you've got to program the spectrometer in order to bring down the information data that you need. You've got to decide lots of different variables. Um, I'm coming on in a little minute to the key ante, but this is a sample of the, of the spectrum. Very rich in, in iron lines, lots of different iron species there, lots of different elements there. Um, lots of, um, obviously, results that we obtained. One of the, I'm just going to give you a couple of samples, but one of my favorite results that uh, we we got was work with Dave Pike. As I said, he not only was a very good software guru, but he was a very good um, technical uh, an analysis. And we actually were able to see uh, or catch a flux rope as it emerged. And we caught it in oxygen five, and we could see uh, the shift in along this along the slit. We could see the shift in wavelength, so we were able to determine the rotation of this flux rope as it came towards us. I found this really exciting, and I, I saw it as one of the early signatures. We also did some work with spicules that the magnetic flux 
uh, was twisted. And when it erupts, you see this twist again. Uh, with Iris, this is very obvious in some of the results that they're obtaining. Not just that, but obviously, you know, you get a lot of kudos if you can get a press release out there and, you know, get a bit of publicity for it. So I, <laughs> I devised um, a little press release which said solar, solar tornadoes on the sun. I think that's been used again a little bit later on, but that was the first thing. Um, so this hit the Daily Mail. You know, you, you get the good newspapers. So front page, this is the front page of the Daily Mail. So that space storm that could paralyze the world. You know, they don't do things in halves, do they? Terror at 300,000 miles an hour. Scientists fear deadly tornadoes around the sun will cause havoc with all our satellites and wreck our communication systems. Even the coverage of the World Cup could be at risk. <laughs> we hit the jackpot there. Another piece of work that I'm very proud of Soho is um, we work with Suma and uh, work with Don here at the Southwest Research Institute and oops it is it's going on it's got a mind of its own now um, and we um, <coughs> were able from the Suma observations in the polar regions to identify the blue shifted regions in the boundaries of the cell and uh, distinguish this as the uh, source regions for the solar wind subsequently there's been a bit of debate about that but uh, I think these were really good observations and really uh, identified some of the um, features of the, of the fast solar wind. I want to tell you a little bit about Chianti. Um, Chianti, Chianti, or the Chianti. Obviously, you haven't been to Italy. <laughs> Chianti, um, it doesn't mean anything. Everybody said, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It was just something we liked, the, the word. And... Um, it was a collaboration between uh, originally Ken Deere, myself, and Brunella Monsini Fuasi, who is sadly no longer with us, and she worked at Archetri Observatory. And this is a photo taken from Archetri looking out over um, the, the background in, I think it's in Archetri. Uh, Gianna would be able to verify that or not. Um, background there in, in Florence. So it was uh, Chianti, I think also we, we were at Elba at a workshop when we decided this, so we thought, it's got to have an Italian feel to it, so we called it Chianti. We did think up some acronyms to go with it, but they didn't make any sense, and Ken said, look, forget it, it's just called Chianti. We thought that if we called it something nice, people would use it, and it's worked, uh, because people do use it extensively. So uh, we wanted, we had some principles, and we wanted to make it publicly available. We wanted to make it transparent, so that people could see the data that was in there, and we made, wanted to make it freely available. There were other codes, but they were, you had to buy into them, or they were not publicly available, or you had to work with people. We wanted to make this publicly available. So it was first released in 1996, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm very fond of Italy and Archetri, and um, love to go back there. Uh, and I've been there several times, but in particular, Galileo um, was kept under house arrest in close to Archetri, and I think the house is owned by a Archetri Observatory. We've been there. Um, but also, of course, he studied sunspots. And um, this is not moving, but he's got, these are his actual drawings of the sunspots. And I have done some TV work, and we did um, a series of programs called The Seven Ages of Starlight, and I was um, doing the sun. Um, and here we are actually got the telescopes at the Institute of Astronomy, and we're re reliving uh, Galileo's measurements. It wasn't always plain sailing, I'm afraid, because the BBC were insisting on sunspots and, and the sun shining, which in Cambridge is not always possible. So for parts of the, for parts of the filming, they had to simulate the sun with a, with a big lamp, but that's, that's okay. It looked all right in the end. As I said, I'm very passionate about eclipses, and I've had the honor and the privilege to see three of them. Some, some people ask me which was the best, and I tell them it's like your children. I'm not going to say which one's the best. They're all different. This was the first one. And many of us, this was a solar physics meeting in the Caribbean, which, of course, solar scientists love to, uh, love to have meetings in exotic places. I think now with climate change and with air travel, maybe we're not going to have so many of those. But anyway, this is in the Caribbean, and we had um, beautiful blue skies here where we were, not, not necessarily everywhere, but in Guadeloupe. 
And many of us had been studying, as Eric Priest is here, uh, Ken Deere is over there, many of us, Jim Klimchuk, Craig, the forest, many of us had been uh, studying the sun, but had never actually seen the corona with our own eyes. And something quite spectacular. Have any of you not, I'm going to ask you, has anybody not seen a total eclipse? Okay, put it on your list. You have to see a total eclipse of the sun. It's an amazing phenomena, not just from what we, we see, because we know exactly what's happening, which is awesome in itself, uh, but from what happens around you. It's absolutely awesome. I was privileged again to actually see it in the UK. Now, it was a big disappointment for most of the people in the UK, but we had the National Astronomy Meeting um, in uh, the Channel Islands, and we went across to Alderney, I think Sarah. You were there, I know, that's right, I remember you and Mark came over. Um, and several other people came over. So we actually, we went over very early in the morning, and it was cloudy, and then the clouds parted. And we were on a cliff edge above the um, port, and as the lights went down, the lights on the ships came up in the port. It was magical, and I had my family with me, so that was something spectacular. And um, I, I was down there with an ITN crew, that's uh, the UK TV channel. Amazing. So, I've got to get a move on because I'm being rather slow. Hinodi, again, um, fantastic opportunity to work with NASA, Japan, and the UK, and ESA. Luis Hara here is the PI on ICE, the EUV spectrometer, which I again had the privilege to be um, co-investigator co on. Being a spectrometer, it's a complex instrument. We get spectra at different points along the slip, but we have to raster that slip. So we have to devise very clever observing modes to get the information that we want. Uh, this is a sample of a spectrum from, from ICE, from 170 angstroms up to 284 angstroms. Of course, it's important to be able to identify all of those lines. This is made up, um, I think, by Harry Warren, but it shows you the difference between solar minimum and solar maximum from, um, from ice using different spectral lines, which are sensitive to different temperatures. So the blue is silicon 7, which is below a million degrees, and the uh, iron 15, about 3 million. So you can very clearly see, and again here, this is iron 15, solar minimum, solar maximum. You can very clearly see the difference between solar minimum and solar maximum was able to apply a lot of diagnostics to actually measure the electron density um, here um, uh, in an active region. This is an active region on the limb and the temperature of that active region uh, from the ratio of different lines. This was work carried out by my student, Brendan O'Dwyer. I've worked a lot with Dergish Tripathi on both uh, CDS data and ICE data. And this is uh, deriving the densities and then comparing it to the magnetic field for what we call the MOS regions, which are the foot points of the hot core loops. So you've got hot, hot loops in the core of the active region, and we see this, this bright MOS at the foot point regions, very interesting uh, areas. So we were able to correlate that with the magnetic field. So this is one of my favorite pictures, not very scientific, but Brendan's here and Dergish, and we're obviously in Florence, Fiorenza, and uh, just a quote from Galileo. You cannot teach a man anything. You can only help him to discover it for himself. Now, politically correct, that should perhaps now be person uh, rather than man. But anyway, um, great, a great man and a great astronomer. Oh, and the reason I've got it there is not just because I like the picture, but uh, we've had a whole series of uh, coronal loops meetings. K Jim Klimchuk and I were the first to, to start these, and they've been very prof they've been very scientifically profitable. We get together theoreticians, observers, and uh, young people, uh, and we actually try and understand by putting together models and what we're observing to try and understand the heating uh, for coronal loops. And uh, this is one that we had in Florence. We try to choose nice places for the meetings as far as we can. Uh, but of course, we are looking perhaps at models such as Parker's nanoflare models, uh, where the coronal loops get, uh, the, the individual strands of a loop structure get twisted up in the footprint regions. When they get twisted up, um, they reconnect and release magnetic energy. So in this way, energy is transferred up from beneath the surface up into the loop and is then released 
uh, the magnetic energy is released in the form of kinetic energy and um, thermal energy. So these are the types of models we, 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 we compare in detail. With ice, we're ab also able to look at the um, shift in the plasmas as an active region. Blue is coming towards us, and red is flowing down, condensing down. Again, we're able to compare models with what we're actually observing. Uh, one of the models proposed by Giulio Delzana and colleagues uh, is that we get a um, feature called interchange reconnection higher up above the active region. Uh, we get material flowing out from these areas. A lot of work has been done on that, whether this material is flowing into the slow solar wind as part of the formation of the slow solar wind. And we get material um, going up into the active region loops and then condensing down. It would appear that these loops are continuously cooling. So Chianti has lasted a long time. Um, the latest issue was 2019. It's continuously updated. It's very complex data. What we're trying to do is to make it uh, easy for people to use. If you had to go through all of the papers on a particular iron in order to analyze that, uh, the data about that iron, it would take a long time, I can assure you. So what we try to do when we input the data is to assess it, to put in the most recent, the most accurate, that we consider to be the most accurate, we say we do an assessment, and to update it. If there isn't data there, we also um, attempt to calculate it, to fill in the gaps. There's a lot of checking, a lot of benchmarking against solar observations, stellar observations, laboratory measurements. Um, so, uh, and also Chianti is now integrated into many other codes. Uh, so the latest count is over six, uh, 3,600 citations, and this is the number of citations per year. So you can see that it's, uh, it's still increasing. I step back a little bit now since I retired, and I've let the other members of the team uh, get on with it, and their latest uh, version, version 9, is focusing on X-ray and satellite lines, and they are developing more sophisticated atomic data to go in there. Just to give you a sample, uh, this is iron 12, and the, the transitions we might be looking at might be between these configurations here, but in order to get those accurate, we need to include all of these levels and sophisticated calculations. I don't have time to go into the details of that, um, but I can assure you it's a lot of work. And we have a network of um, people working in the UK um, it's called the FAP Network, and it's led by Nigel Bagnall here, who's at Strathclyde University. And working, this is uh, Pete Storey at UCL, uh, Julio, um, and myself, and Louis, who is working as a postdoc. Um, so we've been working now for several years, producing huge amounts of atomic data, accurate atomic data, reliable atomic data, still updating it, uh, which uh, has given to major revisions into the Chianti database, and other places. So moving on in time, because I'm running out of time, Solar Dynamics Observatory, fantastic, wonderful observations, with high resolution, 12 second cadence, a range of temperatures in different ultraviolet bands. We need to understand what's contributing to that bands, and we've done a lot of work in this regard by looking at the spectral lines that are contributing under different conditions, and that's been non-trivial, and that's been led by Julia, but now we have a very good understanding of what's contributing to those bands. This is um, a flare, uh, if it's running, it is running, uh, in different temperatures. So fantastic, to, and going up to uh, 10 million degrees, so a very um, high temperature line, 918. Possible then to track the heating and cooling of these events, different events that we see, using this data, but there is some ambiguity there. Of course, we've, um, when the sun was a little bit more active than it is now, um, we've been able to see uh, flares with um, SDO. If a flare gets too bright, it's not good for us uh, because it, 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 it um, saturates the detectors. So actually, we're quite fond of smaller flares because first of all, they fit into the field of view, and secondly, they don't necessarily saturate the detectors. So um, one of the things we might do is to compare it to the standard models that we have for flares. And of course, 
a lot of work being done on hard X-ray emission from flares as well, uh, looking for the energy release from the hard X-rays with RESI and FOXI, of course, now. So here we can see the flare. This is old trace data, but uh, in the UV, the limb of the sun here, and then these huge loops growing after the flare, after the initial release has taken place. I worked um, a fair amount um, with colleagues on the structures we call sigmoids, including with Sarah very early on, um, which are the sign. This is um, inverse image in, in X. In, uh, this is actually, I think, from CDS. But in inverse, uh, Im an image in X-rays, you see this S shape, this sigmoid structure, which is an indication that the active region is getting uh, twisted and complex and is likely to erupt. Of course, the prediction of eruptions, of the eruption of energetic events or of flares is an area of, of great interest if we can see them, the active region getting more complex and we can predict when that happens. Of course, we've got some ideas on that. I'm not sure it's been completely pinned down, but an area of great interest. I've done a lot of work on this with um, Yarrow Didik and colleagues in, in Madon, um, looking at the process of uh, slipping reconnection and this is this kind of 3D model of what we saw earlier as a standard model for flare to see how we can track the footprint features and the development of the flare. It's a great privilege for me in 2010, almost 10 years ago, to have a solar physics meeting in Cambridge organized by my postdocs and students, uh, Dergish and Julia and the other uh, students and postdocs there, um, to, on plasma spectroscopy to look at the achievements and future challenges. Uh, there was representation from all over the world, from Japan and the USA. Um, it was my 60th birthday, so next year is my 70th birthday, but I'm not expecting another meeting of this kind. The idea was to have it when I was still able to, my brain was still working, and to have a wonderful celebration when all the people were there. And it was indeed a great privilege to, to have it. Iris, of course, um, launched in 2013, and uh, we're very fortunate to work closely with the Iris team, and in particular um, with um, uh, Mark and, and Leon and all the other people, and Vanessa Yarrow there. Uh, but it, it, it has the advantage of being a, a fantastic spectrometer, it has a small field of view, of course, but it also, the slit's dark here, we can actually see what we're looking at very clearly without any ambiguity. So one of coming, returning to um, Iron 21, uh, my, my student Vanessa did a lot of work on, on Iron 21, looking at the, at the foot points and the evaporation uh, coming up from the foot points with the Iron 21. Again, very able with that carbon one line to be very clear about what the wavelength shifts were relative to the chromosphere. I have another student, um, Sargan Mule, who's finished her PhD about a year again year ago, and she's been working on um, jets um, from the perspective of uh, different observatories, ICE, IRIS, STO, and we, uh, we've got some interesting results, which I'm going to perhaps share in a little bit more detail tomorrow. Back to eclipses. Of course, you've had a major solar eclipse going across the USA. I mean, how lucky is that? Fantastic. And I was extremely privileged to be part of that. I really, really wanted to go to it. I really wanted to be part of it. And I was at the um, Rocky Mountains National Park as the NASA solar representative. Um, Alex um, sent out an email one day saying, because uh, uh, are there any solar experts interested? And, and before I'd even read the email, I'd hit the, hit the return and said, fantastic, yes, I'd love the opportunity uh, to come. Fantastic experience. Mythology connected with eclipses sometimes. Probably know about the Chinese and the dragon eating the sun. Well, the Cherokee Indians believe that a giant frog is eating the sun. So I was learning something new. Of course, we do science at eclipses as well. And uh, Shadi Abal <coughs> and her team, tremendous to see the um, green line, colored green here, and the red line, the iron 10 line and the iron 14 line, and how, just how complex um, that interplay is between the different temperatures. We are hopeful, and, and maybe this is a little bit fanciful, that by comparing the forbidden lines 
with the ultraviolet lines from ice, for example, we might be able to uh, have a we might be able to have a m measure in some way of the non-Maxwellian uh, properties if we might be able to compare the two. But that's work that um, Yarrow uh, did it. We've been doing with Yarrow did it. Julia has been working quite closely with um, Ed DeLuca, as has Phil, I believe, on their eclipse observations. And um, they've, they've um, got results already published from for 2017, and they've just flown again in 2019, and I believe they've got some, some very good results. Jenna here was uh, Ed's student, and is now, um, I think she now has a position at CFA, very bright young lady who was responsible for building that um, uh, instrument. Very difficult, very complicated to actually keep tracking it and to get those results. Very nerve-wracking. Of course, we have DKIST coming up, and that has some fantastic opportunities. Um, it, over the chromosphere, all, all layers of the solar atmosphere, of course, our, my interest is still in the coronal lines, and for example, in the uh, lines we see listed here, uh, to try and do some uh, diagnostic measurements. So we've had, I think, a fantastic uh, past 20 years with all sorts of wonderful observatories, some individually looking at results, but also working together. Looking to the future, we also have uh, Parker Solar Probe, the first results should be available fairly soon, I believe, and they'll be very exciting. That doesn't actually look at the sun, it looks at the solar wind, uh, but Solar Orbiter will be launched in uh, 2020, and uh, my, my, my pleasure is that it has a spectrometer on it, SPICE, uh, which will look at a small field of view, but there are a lot of uh, interesting observations that can be um, carried out with that, and um, I think Don Hassler's uh, Southwest Research has been very much involved in that as well. What sorts of things might we be looking at? Well, we might be looking for the source of the slow solar wind, the source of the fast solar wind. has been pretty well studied and pretty well understood, I believe, more so than the, the source of the uh, slow solar wind, which uh, originates in the active regions. One of the features that I haven't been into detail is that you might be able to track this by looking at abundances of elements. Many things change as the as the plasma flows into the solar winds, the temperature might change, the density certainly changes. But the abundances remain the same. It's a tracer that doesn't change. So that actually, if you could, and we believe from the work that Julia has done, that the core of the active region has what we call a FIP effect, a first ionization potential effect of about three, whereas most of the rest of the sun has photospheric. So that actually we might be able to, when you open up those um, core uh, magnetic uh, core loops, and we might be able to be able to use that as a tracer. Solar orbiter uh, will take a little longer, uh, and it won't go as close to the sun. But as I say, it does have uh, the, the the advantage of um, having a spectrometer as well as sampling the sun. Um, the spice instrument will see these wavelength ranges, and as I said, it can be used for many diagnostics and um, also for abundances. I've worked a lot with India. I've talked about um, uh, Dergis Tripathi here and his, uh, his postdocs and his students. And uh, Indian Space Research Organization will be launching a, so a solar satellite called Aditya, which will go to the L1 point. It'll be launched in 2020. It's the same position as SOHO. And it has many very interesting instruments on. So although uh, up until now it has been built entirely by the Indian Space Research Organization. There hasn't been much opportunity to collaborate on a scientific front once the um, data, et cetera, is coming in. Uh, collaboration, scientific collaborations will be established, and Dergish is having a meeting in, in February to try and start that process off. Before I finish, and I will finish very quickly, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the outreach work I do. Connected with the uh, 1999 eclipse, we started an outreach project called Sunblock 99, based at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, which was to inform people about the sun and what we were doing with it. We developed this uh, with, with Dave Pike, who still works with me, into a project called SunTrack, which has a lot of information about the sun. But this is aimed at um, mainly school children, I'd say at the age of about 12, 13, 14 has information, it has role models, it has classroom projects. And it is extremely well used, not just by people in the UK, but by a lot of people in the, in the USA and worldwide. 
Um, but um, more recently, I've taken this forward, um, and I've been working directly with, uh, with schools. I worked a lot with our UK, um, ESA UK astronaut, Tim Peake, when he was up on the space station a couple of years ago. For us, you have to understand, for us in the UK, it's very exciting to have an astronaut on the International Space Station. For you now, it's a bit matter of fact, because they go up all the time. For us, it was very exciting. He wasn't the first person from the UK in space. Uh, Helen Sharman was the first uh, person from the UK in space on the Mir spacecraft. And uh, people like Michael Fole, who was actually got a PhD from Cambridge and actually British. He had an American mother and he became a NASA astronaut. He's an extremely good speaker. He was actually also um, an astronaut in space. And he was on the Mir space station when it had a, a near collapse. Um, so, but it's very exciting for us. And we had a huge amount of money put into, uh, by the, uh, the UK government, put into working with schools to try and encourage um, and enrich science in schools and to, um, you know, fire the imagination of the children. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in that. But following on from that, um, I have a project which brings artists in and works with artists. And scientists and artists go into schools together to develop uh, creativity in the schools. And this has been hugely successful. Uh, we're working with quite a young age group, as you can see there, because the philosophy or the thought is that actually you capture them when they're young. By the time they're 16 or 17, they're kind of well established. Of course, we can go and talk to them, encourage them, but f opinions are formulated when children are quite young. Um, so uh, this project is funded by our research council, uh, Science Technology Facilities Council, and um, they fund our, our research, but they also fund a huge amount of outreach throughout the UK, and this is dispersed throughout the UK. And they funded SunTrek from the start, and they funded uh, this project that I'm leading at the moment. So it's been a great pleasure and a great honor uh, to work with the children. We don't just work with children in Cambridge, because Cambridge is quite a science-rich area. We're working with children throughout the country, in Manchester, in Wales, in London, in different parts of London where they, they, they don't have access. Some children have never met a scientist. Um, so we're, we're working with what we call um, children with low science capital that maybe haven't encountered scientists before. We've also worked with, this is a, this is a young lady at a deaf school, and she's making a, made a, a mobile there in the, in the style of um, Alexander Calder, the artist, and uh, individually they made things and then they put together. You can see by the smile on her face uh, what a lot of um, pleasure, confidence, excitement the children feel when they create something. And it reinforces their learning. So we get them to write about what, what they've created. This is, I think, the solar system with stars. The sun is a star. We've also done some things like creating an iBook. So as was mentioned at the beginning, I was very honored to be awarded the RES Annie Maunder Medal for Outreach, particularly because this is Annie Maunder. And you'll all know about the Maunder Minimum. You'll all know about Maunder. But she actually was a very good astronomer in her own right. And this book that um, is her and her husband was actually written probably mainly by her. Um, she's, um, as was the case in days gone by, the men tended to get the credit for, for, for what the women had done. They weren't really acknowledged. But also, if you were working together in an institute um, and you got married, then the woman could no longer work at that institute, for example, at the Royal Greenwich Observatory. So it was a great honor for me to be awarded this medal, in particular because it was a medal in honor of this uh, woman, Annie Mulder, who was Irish, I think, originally. So I've almost finished, you'll be pleased to hear. I would say that I've had a fantastic opportunity during my lifetime to work on so many solar missions. I'm very grateful for my colleagues in the USA in NASA and here in Boulder and elsewhere to have had that opportunity to collaborate. It's enriched and it's, it's been a very positive influence. Um, I would also say that in, in, in my field, in solar physics, we have a high representation of females. Um, and this is just a, just a few of them. Uh, Lydia from LSSL, Lindsay Fletcher from 
Monica Louise, who's now over in Switzerland, and Inika up at St. Andrews. And um, as I say, you can tell from this picture which one is retired. <laughs> but that was on the way back from, from Hinodi 12. But we've had a, a great deal of, of, of um, enjoyment and supporting each other and supporting younger females in, in the field. So I just say thank you very much for listening. <laughs> no, I don't drink red wine. <laughs> I only drink, drink white wine. wine. <laughs> Wasn't me that called it. I would have called it Pinot Grigio or something. Probably wouldn't have been popular if it had been Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> yeah. So have we got time for a couple of yeah, questions sure. or comments? Yes. Yeah. Two comments. One is there's December 14th, 2020. There's an eclipse coming up in Patagonia. And it should be a good one. Okay, uh, thank you. But my main comment is that a number of the discoveries in solar physics get taken over into stellar physics. Oh, yes, of course. For example, the Iron 21 line that you mentioned several times, which is mentioned for Angstrom, is seen all the time. And stellar spectra, sometimes no Doppler shift, sometimes blue shift. Yeah. I've seen it with a red shift. But it's, you know, the studies that, we, that you and others have done in solar physics are immensely valuable. Or non -solar physics work. I couldn't agree more, and and I and, and vice versa. I think some of the, st the the interface between solar physics and stellar physics. I mean, at one time, I was working more closely with the stellar physics community as was Julia, and I think it's very fruitful um, to to have that overlap and that and that interaction. And if I had another lifetime, maybe I could focus on the stellar physics, <laughs> get someone else to do it. But I agree entirely. Um, and also some of the, although you uh, haven't necessarily got the uh, resolution to see the features, but you get, you can, you've got very good um, instruments in different wavelength range, which we're envious of, I think, in, in solar physics. So with regard to the eclipses, yes, um, my ambition now, I've, I've done an eclipse in the USA, but there is an eclipse going across Antarctica uh, <laughs> fairly soon. And um, my husband and I are already booked onto the cruise ship. Hopefully, it's, the likelihood of seeing it is very low because the weather is not good in that area of Antarctica. But that, of course, would be our, our life dream. We've, we've done talks in the past called Ice and Fire because he studies. He's in, he's in the cold regions and I'm in the hot regions. But that, of course, would, would be fantastic if we were able to do that. Yeah. Really? Okay. So it's much worse than we may expect to see. That may be a sign of another stem. But um, I, that's just so nobody feels like they're also supposed to be so <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I was wondering what your perspective is on the concept that women and other minority researchers have to do a lot more, or are expected to do a lot more mentoring and non paper writing sort of work, and how that impacts your. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a good, good point. I think it's very hard. People like Inika, for example, who's at St. Andrews, because she's a very strong uh, woman professor in the field, she gets landed with a lot of the uh, work. Right? We, had, we have uh, the um, um, Daphne Jackson Awards. As each of the departments, physics departments, is allocated a um, sort of star, a gold medal or whatever, which actually can be fun implicate funding as well if, if they're good at diversity, etc. So sometimes they get landed with that. Sometimes you get landed with a lot of mentoring. Now, Inika and people, I mean, I've shown you a, a picture before this one of us. Now, we're all of a certain age. None of them are as old as me because I was retired, but we're there of the next generation. And, and Inika and others are very worried, actually, that the, the younger generation, there's a, there's a bit of a gap there. And certainly in the UK, we have a huge problem, which is why probably people like Vanessa are over here, is that we have a little bit of a gap between when you finish your PhD and when you get a permanent position. Most of our positions are in universities. 
And um, it's difficult to fill that gap. It's difficult to get the, the contracts and things like that. OK, if you can travel or you can go somewhere else. That's not always possible. So we have quite a high dropout rate of people. I've got a very good, uh, Christine Chafour was another very good student of mine. I haven't mentioned to her. She worked with Brian Dennis on RESI, fantastic scientist. And she made the decision that she wasn't going to try and stay in, in academia when she finished. She went to work for the patent office. I think she was trying to follow in Einstein's footsteps. Um, but she also decided to get married. She's got two children. And it was much easier for her because then she would have worked for a while before she got maternity leave. And she's very happy. Some of the skills, of course, that she learned doing it as a student could be applied, you know, the, the reading, the, the, the looking, researching. And so she was very happy in the job as well. So I, I don't think that all of our graduate students necessarily have to go into academia or into research. I think there are other opportunities in other areas. Um, but I do think it's difficult. I've, I've, I try to be, put a positive spin on it, but I do think, I mean, I would have said several years ago it was all more like 30% in the UK, but now I think it's probably dropped quite a bit as well. And it, it's difficult for anybody to pursue a career. And I think with um, other commitments, it, it's, uh, it's more difficult. Yeah. But yeah, I think we are addressing diversity as a whole, and I think it's not just the women it's bringing in. Uh, why aren't we attracting a more diverse uh, a s range of scientists, you know. The follow-up to that would be that what needs to change in the field in order to make it more inclusive? Bring the people in the door for them to serve. I think, you know, I, from just observing you lot this week, the workload is pretty horrific that you have. <laughs> All of you have a very heavy workload. Um, that's not always compatible with other responsibilities that you might have. It's quite difficult to balance some of those sometimes. So I think there needs to be a recognition. Now, when I had young children, I worked part-time for quite a time. Okay? That may be regarded as, come on, she's not committed. But actually, in the part-time, I did the same amount of work as, you know, and I worked more than part-time, of course. But then when it came to promotion, they're going, oh, what are we going to do with this? You know, here we've got someone with part-time. We don't know how to handle that. So I think the recognition that somebody is good, even if they have other commitments, and it doesn't have to be children, it could be parents, it could be anything, other commitments, needs to get through into the system that this person is good and has something to contribute. And we shouldn't necessarily judge them on the standard model of a person. And I think that's difficult. And I think that the work-life balance... Now, I was in a faculty meeting, faculty board meeting in a maths faculty in the university, and the meeting started at 5 o'clock, and around about, I think it was, maybe it started at 4 o'clock, but around about 5.30, um, one of our senior members of the faculty, who then was, he wasn't head of the department at the time, but he was saying, he got, got up, and the chairman said, well, where are you going? He said, well, actually, I'm going to go and pick my children up from school. You know? Now, that is a lesson and I think that the senior people, if they are sympathetic to the fact that people do have other responsibilities, it makes it better for everyone. You know? Um, and I think that that's a difficult thing to do, but I've been very fortunate in that head of department and other heads of department have been very sympathetic that I, I do a valuable work. My work is very high international reputation. I work hard, but I also have other commitments as well. But that's not always recognized. Are there any other questions, not on, not on diversity, but on anything else? OK. Anybody else want to share anything? Come on, sit in there. Share something with us. You must have some stories to tell, Phil. Yeah. So I will comment on one And woman house. <laughs> Well, I remember it might be 
PhD exam and I think everybody felt worse. But I remember uh, when the examiner was asking me the question about abundances or something and I was going, eh. And he was going, because at that time that he was in there, he was going, Helen, you know that, you know that, you know that. It's like, yeah. But okay. Oh, well, maybe he was more sympathetic to his own students. <laughs> he was a great support throughout. He, yeah, he did. And he had the patience to, to talk to you and tell you and explain it to you. Uh, but also, he was very supportive throughout my life at, at difficult times. When I mean, at one time, I, 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 one of my regrets, and you can't have regrets, I don't believe in regrets, but one of the things I kind of wish had happened was that I was going to spend a year here in Boulder. And um, I still could now, yes, uh, but it's maybe a little bit late in life. But yeah, but I was, I think, I, and then I, then I um, got pregnant with my second child, and we cut it down to six months. But then the person my husband was going to work with got made redundant, so the whole thing fell through. And at that time, I went to my supervisor because everything had fallen through. The grants had fallen through to Mike Seaton, and I said, "Oh, Mike, you know, list of." Blah, 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 blah. And he said, "Don't worry." He said, "Sometimes the unplanned things in life are the best." You know, and he was right. It worked out okay in the end. But I think that that support, that optimism, you know, is really good. And then I can remember going to a conference once and, uh, you know, going to look at the posters and he's standing there puffing on his pipe and said, Helen, have you got a poster here? And I said, no, I haven't. I've got two children. You know, I haven't got a poster. He said, well, you've got to stuck a photo of your children up. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. But it wasn't a dismissal. It was, it was, uh, it was a still a recognition that you had something worthwhile. And I think that's, that's what I'm saying, yeah, recognition that you had something worthwhile. Thank you all very much.